Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us at this very special episode of The Opening. This is episode 50. We made it, Fran. So The Opening is the place where hope is happening. And we are so privileged and grateful that we are connecting with people all over the world who share in our desire to bring hope. And Fran and I are both in the province of Alberta, Canada. We both specialize in rapid transformational therapy. Fran is still teaching full-time as well, and she's been a teacher for 34 years now. And I do rapid transformational therapy full-time. So, Fran, I am giving you the floor to introduce our wonderful guest today. Thank you, Marina. And she truly is a wonderful guest. And she's a fellow Albertan. So welcome, Carlin Fisher. Yay! Thank you for Carmen. having me. Nice oh, to be here. <laughs> it's our pleasure. So Carlin is a neural optimization coach, taking over her new and innovative field. She is passionate about the topics of neuroplasticity and the nervous system and its calibration. Her mission is to inspire highly motivated individuals by teaching them how to engineer their minds. These tools allowed her to overcome her autoimmune condition and transform her life. She speaks the language of overachievers. With a background in engineering, she doesn't shy away from the innovative conditions of the mind. She bridges the two worlds with a strong background in science and knowledge in holistic health. Welcome, Carlin. It's so great to have you here. Well, I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Yeah. So we, um, I've listened to a bit of your background, and I know a little bit about your history. So can you tell our viewers uh, a little bit more that you'd like to share about yourself? And how, how was it that you got into, really, it's a newly created field. I've never heard of neural optimization before. How did you get into it? I got into it actually because it was so new and it was because it was so underutilized, but it's something that I use through my health journey because uh, when I was 19, I was sick with an autoimmune condition and you kind of have like your ups and lows and especially with school, depending on if you were like stressed with your course load or different things. And I was definitely like the overachiever driven person where sometimes like you definitely have blocks where it's like, oh, do I need that thing or do I not? But your mind's like, no, you need to do that because what would happen if you didn't get that thing or what would people think of that status or something like that? Like I was definitely that engineered type of person that was like, no, you cannot fail. So I, yeah, I kind of went through my highs and lows of that and I got so sick of actually trying to let other people fix me that I just started taking my own courses and empowering myself to do it in my own hands and then that's when I discovered more about these fields or like the fields of epigenetics and like psychoimmunology and how much they could really impact me or how when research talk about okay your thoughts influence your cells and you're just like no way like there's no way that one thought can influence like your cells and then you kind of decode the whole system and you start to learn a little about it or the fact that sure like your emotions are valid but the, all, that also you can get addicted to your emotions so there's certain times when you do go through something but there's certain times when you're like hey I cannot be addicted to this this cannot be my reality so really navigating that field is just eye-opening and something that I really wanted to share with the world because it was the thing that helped me the most and I would kind of fluctuate between like a super positive person but when I was doing something wrong I was pretty negative like pretty hard on myself because I was so focused on like the end goal and the final so it was one of those things where if I don't know this, imagine how many other people don't know this. And it's the whole science field. So if we can break it down for them, imagine what they can do with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you talk about neuroplasticity. Um, can you explain to our viewer, viewers what is neuroplasticity and why is it so impactful on human health? Like what what is this all about, Carlin? So the way I view neuroplasticity is if you look at a hiking trail or any sort of path that you've, that's been well marked that you're walking down 
And when you walk down this little hiking trail or path, I'm sure with your group, you've noticed that there's a little path that's not really marked that someone might take a couple steps down and they might assume that that's the trail. And then someone in the group will backtrack and say, hey, wrong way, you weren't paying attention. And then that person will slowly make their way back to that growth. If you imagine your mind and if you had a path between, I always do this, but do I want to do this one? That same thing in your mind is going to call you back and send you that way. And the reason is because your mind is structurally changed. So when we talk about habits, and I don't have that habit or I have this habit, the missing component is that you structurally change your brain to do that habit. So if you want to not do that habit, we're going to have to structurally change it back. But the reason neuroplasticity, and there's a couple other fields that talk about your neurons in your mind. And if you look at your neurons, you have 500 billion networks. So it's like a sky full of stars. So if you can imagine all those stars and imagine all the ways to connect those and a few connections that you might have that might not be optimizing you or that might kind of change your tone throughout the day. If you can imagine once you stop connecting those, they actually go away, which is the coolest thing that no one tells you. And it's that fight to do it. But once you stop using those pathways, they're not the path of least resistance. So your brain will not take them. That's amazing. It, it reminds me a lot of the kind of work that Fran and I do because we we work a lot on changing habits and, and we we give people a recording to kind of help them to guide them through those new neural pathways. So how would you help an overachiever? I know you target them specifically. And tell us a little bit how you can help them. I feel like the first thing you need to know is that anytime you try to slow them down, they're not going to be interested. So you have to first market it in a way that they're or target them to be like, hey, this will speed you up. But you have to give them a little bit of the why. Because especially like if you are like, okay, if you take a break, all they see is a break. They're not interested in it. But if you can tell them something like when you take a break, you're actually letting your brain reset so it can like flip a ship, flip a switch and not be in that fight or flight. And that fight or flight is not optimal for the project that you're big on. So what if we did this? Then they'll be like, oh, okay, I guess that's helping me. But it's always making sure that they can get that next step to start. And then you can kind of go in little branches from there. But I think mm -hmm. one, they want to know that. And then two, you can kind of start bringing in calmness aspects because a lot of the overachievers, their nervous system is so addicted to like the thrive of the go. So then you have to work on backtracking their nervous system a bit because if you just say to like the person that doesn't sit still like meditate for five minutes they're they're like it doesn't work for me I don't like that that's not my thing but it's like but your nervous system isn't calibrated for that five minutes so we gotta build you something to get you there to help you reset so you can go for that thing because a lot of overachievers sure sometimes they're on a mission and they're really passionate about it but sometimes they don't know why they do it they just know they need to so it's depending on their circumstances of what they really want to go forward with mm -hmm. yeah it's super interesting um like marina and i uh usually have guests that are you know older than you so um with you know more life experience more you know we get we have more baggage i mean <laughs> what can we say right but you seem super like you seem like the age of my daughters, maybe even younger. Like it's when we're recording this, this is January in 2023. And I know when I was, you're in your twenties, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I know when I was in my twenties, <laughs> I had no clue. I had no clue that I was, that I was even doing, you know, high achiever I don't even know if I was a high achiever at that point it was more of just trying to you know pay the rent and survivor that's all survive. <laughs> you know like uh, yeah. you know just hang out with friends and uh maybe I'll go to university and like uh the fact that you're not only you've got a degree in engineering uh you've started you've started basically your own entrepreneurship your own business working in a field that is 
Uh, super. It's a hot, I believe it's a hot topic. Uh, but you're, you're just so young yet. It's like, well done, Carlin, well done. And oh, uh, you. the, your focus group, the, the high achievers, how do you classify that? How do you like, I think I'm kind of a high achiever, right? But how do I know that about myself? Like, what do you have like a criteria for, to be a high achiever? Or well, you thank you for saying that first part. I appreciate it. But honestly, it's more if they resonate with it, right? Like there are certain things where one is like, do you sit still? Most people will say, some say yes, some say no, but especially the people that don't sit still, yes. I think about the ones on a mission that you know those ones that if you literally took away that dream from them they'd like run you over like a train like almost like they're on the track and like you just can't get in their way and so I just like that that drive but really it can help support anyone but I just see if it resonates with them as an over like if I say overachiever or that dr drive if they're like oh I think that's me then then I'm like okay this will help you. But if they're like, oh, no, I'm not that interested or invested because some people are still, I don't really care, right? Like about, they're like, that's cool. You told me that. I know I'm doing stuff wrong, but I don't care, right? Where some people are like, whatever that is, I don't care, but I need it for this next thing. Those are kind of the people that uh, they're fun because they don't care. They're just so open to that next thing because it's like, okay, I don't know but I need that. And then the next thing they're like, I don't know, but I need that. Cause they're so goal oriented that they'll pick up any pieces and not the ones that are like scattered, but very centralized. Right. There's like the type of person, like, like I said, with the train that would literally run you over. If you stood on that track, you just would want to get out of their way. So Carla, before you got sick with an autoimmune disease and before you got into this field specifically, was that you? Uh, a little bit yeah like I think okay. I I think I wanted to get out of the place I grew up like the little town like I was always very adventurous and like always wanted to travel so I work hard and I would do it without meaning to and no one really made me which was funny like my dad had like um, a shop in an office and he used to let us girls clean them instead of hiring someone else but like one morning I would like wake up at five and go do that. And then I would go to school and I would do work after. And like, he wouldn't tell me to, or he was just like impressed because I'd do it before school. But it was, to be honest, it was because he'd pay us more and I didn't want, like I wanted to have that. So I wouldn't want like any other time to do it. Right. Cause he'd be like, if you don't want this job, like you won't have it. So I'd rather like do it in the morning before. And it wasn't every day, but I would just do that side of thing. Or even I look back at now and it was, the end of high school I could have had a couple spares and that was like the only two spares I took because I was always the kid that worried about like what if I need physics like what if I need this class like what if I need that like I'm not redoing them like I'm not taking any more in college and like no one told me that I just decided hey like you need all of these to get to the next level so I took a college course that they offered for free in high school with my like two spares and I took it from January to April and then I only had two months of high school without a full semester which is rare for kids that age and I don't know why I did that but I I did like I would just kind of do little busy things like that where it was like very goal oriented and driven but I would also run my like fight or flight really high and I also would do I noticed I was a little bit of a people pleaser in high school where you really not, didn't want to stir the pot so you kind of revolve around it or what I could make myself do like I was good at it or I did have the like sleep is for the week you know or you'd like stay up and do stuff and then you'd like wake up and work or do things like that so I don't know where I had that drive from but I just wanted to like recenter the people that really did because even in engineering school I could wake up early before an exam at nine and study at five for that exam and go write it but I've only slept for like five hours because I was worried if I didn't absorb the information and I wasn't worried about, I would go work out, but I wasn't worried about, Hey, if you sleep better, that'll be great. That'll help your exam. I was like, sure. Cool. But if I don't have the information, like I'm totally screwed or if I don't have this. So that was like my route as a student is like always work harder, work harder, work harder. And so your body let you down. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's then like, it's you know, funny because it's like you said, until your body let you down. But if your body wouldn't let you down, you'd still be there, right? Yeah. yeah. So tell me about, if you don't mind talking about that, when, what was the turning point for you? How did that show up for you? How did you, how did you deal with it? How did you turn this all around? I feel like I would just do like since I was 19 I would find something and then kind of keep going and then something would happen and then it would go back down like it would be like one time at work when I was um I was 24 there was an issue like a hierarchy issue with my boss and his boss and then I was underneath them and they tell me like different things to do so again I would work as a young engineer, I'd be, I'd work like 16 hours that day to try and finish what they wanted me to finish. Cause they'd be arguing about it. And for some reason at the time, you're like, why didn't you have the understanding that you didn't have to do that? But I would do that for like a couple weeks, but I would eat super healthy as I did that, or I would do certain things. And then I just got really sick again. And that was like the point where I was so tired of having like doing good and then something impacting me even though like I did my health I did my workouts like I I would go sleep right after I did my job but I was still kind of hitting that point there so after that I just decided one that work sure it's important but also like if you die they don't care they're gonna hire someone else right like the truth of the matter is they will right you, they will in a heartbeat because that's how it works so if you kill yourself from them it's not helping you really and then from there I just started learning different courses online I was always interested in health and I am a self-learner a lot so that did help so I had a knowledge and understanding and I would like eat sort of super healthy and do certain things but it was understanding like my mind and my nervous system and how that will impact me to actually go for that next level of healing well you talk about the vagus nerve and yeah. how important that is to gut health and how important gut health is to mental health. So can you um, just give us some background on that? Like I'm not really up on the vagus nerve. Like it's, I know a lot of, um, there's a lot of talk about the vagus nerve and how important it is. Can, can you just inform me and our viewers about the vagus nerve and what it does? Sure. So I'll give you an example. So what happens with your vagus nerve is it's basically your fight fight or fleas or fawn center, where it's basically deciding from the mind and from the body, how are we going to react to the stressor? So for example, when I was worried at work and I would work 16 hours and I would eat, say like a super healthy smoothie and I take these supplements and you do stuff because you had to like work, but you didn't care about the like time period about taking breaks because you were just like, hey, just focus and work. What would happen is your mind would send signals and then that nerve would activate. And when this nerve activates, it's essentially telling your body to be in that fight or flight, freeze or fawn. And if it's in that fight or flight, what it's doing is it's increasing your adrenaline. It's increasing your cortisol. It's dilating your pupils and it's increasing your heart rate and it's sending all your blood from your organs internally to your muscles. Because if you're going to run away from something, who cares if you digest your food right now? Who cares if your liver detoxes? Who cares, right? So if you stay in that stress point as an overachiever when you work at your desk for eight hours, you probably ate something healthy or did something to nourish yourself, but you just diverted every ounce of blood you have away from that organ. So you're not going to get nourished properly. And then from that nourishment, what that vagus nerve is, it's a two-way highway. So what they found, it's it's technically called, if you want to get scientific, it's the 10th cranial nerve, but it's more than one, but it's back here and it goes from your gut to all your internal nerves back into your mind. So what happens is your gut actually has more neurons and it communicates more with your brain. So when you eat something, it's really important for your body to digest it properly and send those signals back up. Because anything you don't digest or send properly is going to cause inflammation. So if you can imagine that you have food in your body not digested that's inflaming this nerve, then this nerve is going to cause inflammation here. And then what's going to happen is you're going to be in this little cycle. And a lot of people who have like gut health, like mental health issues are in this little cycle. And they've proven that 
you're not what you digest. You are what you digest and assimilate. Because if you eat all this healthy food, but your body can't actually break it down, it's inflaming it. So a lot of people with mental health will have gut health and they won't know. And they'll just be in this little loop where they're stressed about something. And then it sends signals through that nerve to their gut. And then their gut will be stressed because it doesn't have any blood flow to digest. And then that will be inflamed. And then that will go back through that little nerve, through that two-way highway to inflame the brain. And then the brain will further be stressed. So it'll just keep going. And then you can imagine like as you keep doing that in an infinite loop, you're draining your energy reserve. And as you keep draining your energy reserve, then you're not going to be optimal and you're not going to probably get that goal or that thing you want most. Oh, that's fascinating, really. Uh, that is incredible, really, because when you when you look at, um, say, engineering or doctors or, you know, most professionals, but also entrepreneurs as well, uh, it's the go, 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 do it. Uh, you know, it, it, we're so driven. We're so driven to achieve more and I think the achievement itself is a, a dopamine hit right so I mean the more times we hear our boss going well done or um, just giving us a pat on the back and saying uh, or just you know let's let's see if we can get this done faster Fran you know um, it's it's putting us in that stress mode where really it doesn't matter that we're working out and that we're eating healthy. Um, it, it's just like you said, it's just not, it's not doing our body any good. Yeah. Which... And it's like slow down to speed up. Like one of my coaches, like health coaches for healing, she had this little poem. I can't remember where it's from, but it was like, um, slow is steady. Steady is smooth. Smooth is fast because sometimes you're just like fast, is fast, but it's like, no, slow is steady, steady is smooth, smooth is fast. Because if you take that and if you take like your prefrontal cortex and your limbic brain, then that's a whole other topic. Because with neuroplasticity, you're training that one to be alive, right? Like you're training your fight or flight to thrive. Now talk to us about the brain as a system. Yeah. So I don't really see, like sure, like I'm, it's a mindset where you can set your brain and you can like be positive and do these things. But I think about it from engineering, if you can understand that it's a system and why it can really help you because there's times where you have motions and they're valid and sure you get through them and you push through them. And this isn't for like a major dramatic event. This is for like day-to-day -day, like mini stuff or accumulation of stuff where you're feeling this emotion and they even have research on how long you need to feel it to process it, right? So it doesn't impact your body, which is like 30, um, 90 seconds to five minutes is what the research varies between. But what happens is sometimes we stay in that entire state and then we stay in it for hours and hours. And then that puts a response through our nerve, the vagus nerve and keeps going through our body and makes a loop. And then the system is enhanced with our emotional response our neuroplasticity, our fight or flight centers, which we activate, and then also how our nerve responds, because essentially what happens with our system is, sure, we react to an external event, but what can also happen is our nervous system is actually calibrated to look for external events. So they talk about your reticular activation center, which is in your mind. So if you have that set, and for your viewers, that's like if you're looking and you drive a white Ford Escape and you just got it and now you see them everywhere and you're like, oh, look at my car. It's so great. I see it everywhere. But you kind of act like it didn't exist before. It does. And there's a part of your brain that will look for things. And I'll even if you want to try the exercise of look around the room and everything that you see is red, make a note of it. And then if you close your eyes and look for the blue, you probably won't see the blue. And this is where that starts because that blue oftentimes is the thing that can get you 
better. That blue is like your goal or a way out of the thing that you're stuck in. It's like your way out, but you're so focused on the problem that you can't see it. And the problem starts with your focus of you consciously not seeing it of your consciousness level. And then from that consciousness level, you usually have emotional response. And then that emotional response can send your brain into that fight or flight, which triggers that nerve. And from that nerve, your body reacts and then surfaces more to your brain. And then also when you react your body through emotions, what you're actually doing is you're draining it, right? Like if you feel tired, you can tell by your nerve, like how you're exhausted from overthinking that. Or when you run your cortisol and adrenaline to the roof, when you made up a scenario in your mind about what's going to happen, you're running that cortisol and adrenaline through the roof. So you're going to be tired more So then your brain's going to respond more tired and it's just going to be this little system that loops and loops unless you understand how and why that system works, then you can interrupt it and maybe you can logify yourself because there's times where sure you can be mad and someone says, be more positive, like, come on, you know, and you're, you're kind of like, leave me alone. Right. But if you're kind of like, oh, yeah, okay, I know why this does this. And it might not be like you go from here to here, but it might be, okay, I'm going to fight this. Or sometimes we look at like someone who has like a very negative headspace. What they don't tell you is that if you if you stay in that, you're building pathways that direction and it's going to be easier and easier and easier for you to be more negative. And there's a time and a place to like tell that person when they can hear it, but it's also like helping them maneuver it. So they know, because I feel like sometimes when you say, Hey, this sucks where I am, but if you don't tell them that it could get worse, if you, if you keep doing that, then they won't fight it because they don't see that it's easier when you build pathways over here. Right. They know that happiness is there or like this optimal world is there, but they don't think they can have it because they have so many paths running this direction but if you can lay it out for them like a system and say hey like you breathe the same air as everybody else like your body follows the same system so like we can get you there we might have to remove like interferences or traumas along the way but just so you know this is how this works so when you're in between these two zones we'll we'll keep going right where it's like you can see like a concrete result instead of you just being like it's a me problem everyone else can do this but me can't. Mm -hmm. And awareness as well, right? Unless we're aware of our thinking, unless we can take a step back and go, why am I thinking the worst again? Or why am I thinking that when when nobody else is thinking that? Um, Like so many uh, instances come to mind, the the negativity thing is super important, right? Especially like Marina and I have talked about this before. Uh, Some people will look at the world and say, oh my God, it's terrible out there. Uh, There's this and this and this and this and this that's happening. And then somebody like Marina and I, and probably you too, Carlin, when we look at the world, we don't see that. We look at the possibilities and all the... I mean, you know, we are surrounded, we surround ourselves with people who are healers, people who are looking at the world in a positive way and saying, hey, we're going to, we are going to make a difference in the world. And we will, we are here to make it a better place, not talk about the negative stuff, but talk about the good stuff. So you, you talk a lot about how the brain is like a computer. Um, you're in the field of engineering, uh, or you were, uh, and basically science is your, you know, science is your uh, superpower, probably. Um, how do you liken the, the brain to like a computer? So the reason I like this analogy was actually in computer class, I learned a little bit about the system. And the system your computer follows, like original computers, all they were created with was from a zero and a one, a zero and a one, a zero and a one. So if you look at even at at Excel, if anyone uses Excel, if you ever use the if else, if else, right, right, basically saying like (laughs) A or B, 
And what the way I look at the brain too is sometimes you make such like a judgment around it and you're like, oh, it's me. I'm terrible. Like, oh, I did this. And it's like, okay, just like neutralize it. At one point in your life in time or space, you decided to react this way in probably in order to protect yourself. And then you've just been reinforcing that. So if we look at it from a neutral, your mind is like a computer program where it's either choosing a zero or a one. And it chose a one and you didn't want it to. And it chose a couple more ones, but we can like pull you back from those and get it that direction. But if you look at it like a code, it's less judgmental because a lot of us are very judgmental around like, I do this, I do this. Or like you said, with the awareness, like the worst part is when people are aware and they're like, okay, great, I'm shutting down. But it's like, no, 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 no. Like just neutralize it. Because if you see it as a system, as a code, you can program it. And if you look at technology or if you look at social media, social media, what they have is an intention engineer. Have you heard about an intention engineer at all? (laughs) So one yes, one no. So your attention engineer is basically the coder or the engineer and the psychologist behind the screen giving you everything, like feeding all your neurotransmitters, like your dopamine, your serotonin to make you stay on this. But if you look at if they can code me to stay on my phone and click this little buttons, what could I code me to do if I'm aware? Okay, you need to repeat this again. It's like clickbait. It's like clickbait. So is it like on the aneurysm that's following you to decide what this person is interested in? Yeah, Yeah, your algorithm. Like, have you seen the social dilemma? Yeah, exactly. So it's good. You need to watch that. (laughs) Yeah, you need to watch it. But it's like a Netflix show. And it shows you like if you look at your phone screen and you held it up. And then if you looked at the code or the program behind it, somebody built that. Somebody engineered that based on your algorithm to be like, oh, she likes puppies. So I'll send you all the puppies. Or sometimes what happens in the mental health space is everyone will follow someone that make them feel good for like two seconds. And then they follow like. 10 or 12 of them or they'll follow someone that validates them that they get to stay where they are right it'll be like a meme about this a joke about this like haha we're okay we're kind of messed up in this little space right but that's what you're seeing so that's like your consciousness level right it's the same as like if you go to talk to like your same friend group and they talk about the same stuff like they're programming you that direction Mm -hmm. so the psychologist slash attention engineer slash programmer behind this computer is essentially coding you with the computer based on your brain's neurotransmitters and functions to do whatever they want to make sure you stay and to manipulate you yeah and a lot of times it involves advertisement to pay you certain things and um, i can give you some examples um we want to book a flight somewhere overseas so we go on google and you set the flights and the next moment you open facebook there are all these ads for flights from say calgary to cape town how, how did facebook now it's clickbait same thing it's engineered yeah. that way yeah. they follow you to a team yeah. yeah and even like the social media like if you haven't been on in three days they'll be like what is most likely right. For her to stay if we put this first so if they put something you're least interested in first then you'll have the ability to get off but if they are like we haven't seen her in three days how do we get her back cooked they're like oh let's pick this number one thing and if you look at everyone's different followings online like you said like we're healers like we follow people that want to make an impact who do you follow but who do these people over here probably follow which they're probably reinforcing right and it's probably like the can't stories of why they can't have that or why they are where they are Mm -hmm. Mm. that is super interesting yep now i now i understand um so in your field and what you're doing right now how are you you're are you what what groups of people are you working with right now like I'm not sure if you're still doing engineering uh no so I speak to different engineers but I don't actually do um engineering on the side I do like the neuro optimization slash mind sculpting so I do a lot of different groups um I've done 
couple like health programs. I've done some with engineering. I've done some with athletes. Um, I'm working on a couple with like real estate agents and just different firms and businesses that really want to optimize their workers. Because I always think about it like if you look at your workers eight to five and you know that they're running their energy reserve because they're so stressed, like, and you look at like the chronic illness level, especially in the States that people are paying for because the company pays for insurance. It's like one, can we increase their productivity? Because their productivity and wellness probably go together, even though we act like they don't. And two, can we decrease the cost of your insurance? Mm -hmm. mm. Interesting. Very interesting. So one question is, um, if you are focusing on removing old mental programs or how do you apply then on new mental programming, uh, on forming new pen mental programming? Explain that to me. Sure. So you said if you're focusing on an old mental program, how do you apply I'm that removing to it. it. Oh, removing it. Okay. Or I'm so applying new I ones. How do you do that? So the way I see it is you want to see it as a two-part series. So sometimes you might have to go back to find that little why because it's like buried underneath different things. But what you want to do is you want to look at the why of the old or kind of find that behavior. And then you want to apply the new script and really reinforce that because the same way I told you when we're working eight to four or eight to five or whatever, and you're stressed about this deadline and you're eating healthy and you're doing this stuff, but you're putting yourself in that fight or flight in that loop, or they've proven that you running from a mountain lion is just as bad as you thinking you're running from a mountain lion. So you can reverse that because there's the placebo and there's a non-placebo. So essentially what you're doing with that old program that you found is sure you built awareness around it. You might have had to like learn a bit around it, but you don't want to stay there. You're building awareness around it so you can keep going. Like a lot of people will say my anxiety, but really you don't want to associate with your anxiety. You want to say I have anxiety or at this point, but you're building awareness around it to find a tool around it to reprogram you so you don't have to be in that forever because you don't want to live in that limited world, right? There's times where, sure, it can take you months, it can take you years, depending on what happened to you. But really, like, we still want you to have the belief that you're not associating with that thing or it's going to eliminate you and keep you in that old program. So with this new program, you're going to find a couple tools to work on your mind and work on your nervous system to really program you that way. But then you're also going to want to work fully on that new script. And you're going to want to keep visualizing and imagining that new script and really creating that nervous system response with that new one. So that's what becomes your new addiction. So that's what you're feeding. And then that's what you're training to go forward. It's so similar to what we do. Yeah, um, that reprogramming, right? The reprogramming is exactly, mm -hmm. it is exactly what Marina and I do. But, uh, you know, when Marina and I focus on it, uh, we 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 uh, regress our client to scenes or episodes or whatever in their past where they develop this limiting belief. Somehow they develop the belief um, of whatever. It could be whatever. Um, and we do a reprogramming as well. And it's so fascinating how um, you you target such a scientific way of doing it. Like you, yeah. you know, the zeros and ones. That, re that is so appealing to a certain segment of the population, right? The right. And I, th I think that's where some of the problem arises, right? Is because some of the stuff, right? Like you can generalize it under category, but because there's so many people doing it, people are like, oh, but so-and-so does that and so-and-so is messed up. Therefore, I can't do that. They already have like a belief around it before yes. it starts. Whereas yeah. if you add a little sciencey element, they're like, oh, okay, that's, that's different, yeah. right? It's like they have like a little, because they talk about like neuroplasticity and how you have certain words. Because like you said, it is so interesting how they're like, oh, she's not slowing me down. So it's okay. It's safe enough, right? Whereas what you're doing is it's the same thing, but it's just a different target group. Very much so. It's the I, I don't know for sure, because you're, you're the expert at it, but it, it seems to be targeting a group that's more, um, 
uh, not so touchy feely, right? The, not the touchy feely people, but more of the, uh, you know, A type personality that are out there. Like you said, like yourself, 5 a.m., you're cleaning your father's office when, I mean, most for most teenagers, it's 10 a.m. and your mom is trying to get you out of bed. So um, it's it's really a it's fascinating. I I I just and I really love this type of uh, this type of conversation because, um, like Marina and I know, there's so many different journeys. We all yeah. have a different journey uh, where we are, where we came from, where we are right now, and where we're going. And uh, there's so many different ways of healing there's so many different ways of helping people optimize uh their highest potential right um it's i think it's fascinating i oh, thank you and i think yeah you're right like i really come at it from like the logic aspect because i think for me one the outcome especially that i wanted really outlaid my emotion like when i go back and i do um like an emotional energy thing on myself in engineering. I'm like, wow, you felt all of these emotions, but you just said like push them away because you wanted this thing so bad, right? So I think there's a lot of the world that is so logical about their emotion and logical about the result that they'll just like push through it until their body like caves in. But it's like, okay, but if we can get you to feel these, could you go faster, right? Could you go more? Because I do definitely know... Um, even from now, like I have to watch at times, I like the logical aspect of my motion gives me security. Like I know I like that sciencey field of like the why, like why I'm feeling that way or something. It really helps stabilize me. And then I can feel it after, but I have to like balance the two components for sure. Well, and it seems like you in your own life, you're so multifaceted as well. So you, you come from so many different approaches. And I was reading through your bio and it, it says that Carlin is a travel enthusiast. And I know we talked to you and you're maybe heading to Bali and a lot of you just came from Mexico. So that's amazing. You're also a Thai yoga instructor and that's fascinating. You're a holistic health coach. You're an engineer. And this is, I think, the one that fascinates me the most. You are at the bridge between the energy world. So tell me a little bit about that. Okay, so this is the other sciencey part that I see is from going to yoga school to talking about this energy, to talking about your mind and really like tapping in the science behind it. I see them as the exact same world. So whenever I get the clients that are open to both, it's really exciting because a lot of engineering, it's interesting because my mind is not the type that will accept something. Like when we did electric fields and you can't see these fields, I'm not the guy that's like, oh, this is abstract. This makes sense. I'm like, no, I, it doesn't make sense. I cannot see this field in real life. So it doesn't exist. So this is like engineering science that they teach you your typical university where I was not accepting it. I would not I work through my textbook and be like, okay, I guess I have to do this for this class. But to me, that was out there and I didn't see it at first. And then funny enough, I went to yoga school and I'd learn about these chakras and I'd learn about energy fields and I'd learn about this system. And then this made sense with this. And as you kind of start to bridge, it's like a little cliff on both sides where someone's on one, someone's on the other. But there's little things that you start to realize that utilize both. Like, for example, your phone has quartz in it, which are crystals, but it just has a little enough to use. But nobody knows that. Or I talk about little like electric fields all around you. It's like, OK, well, if we use electric fields like this in this part of the world and we look at energy as matter and how everything cannot be created or destroyed, it's just transferred and everything through that energy field. What they're saying over here in the holistic side makes sense too. Or if you look at how the moon controls the tides of the ocean, but then you look at how much water you are in your body and how your gut bugs are actually more active during a full moon and your serotonin level changes during a full moon. So when you do like these gut cleanses, you have to watch the moon because of that. Whereas if you look at these like natural little energies that you don't realize, they're actually the same, but it's bridging them together. And if you've ever done neurofeedback, a lot of what they look at with your mind is 
it's interesting at a hospital how you see a brainwave on the chart and you just like accept you don't know what it is but it's just fine they're measuring it but with neurofeedback they're looking at similar things and they're looking at your mind like its own electric field and it's a heart like an electric field and if you look at interesting enough why can you jump start a car but then with the fibrillator is an emergency you can also jump start a heart like why can you do that if there's like why can you use an electric machine to make an electric current through the heart to pulse it and keep going if it doesn't have some sort of electrical component of it. So a lot of the times they'll talk about your thoughts and how your mind is a field. And then they'll look even at your nervous system and how you are, what you attract and how you kind of admit that out and you keep going. And in engineering school, again, I wasn't accepting this, but we did studies on the law of attraction where you put two different strings and you have to do the math and you'd have to do like sine cos, like blah, 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 this formula and this formula and have to explain why when one vibrated at that frequency, why the other one would naturally follow it. And you had whole fields on it, but essentially the law of attraction that they talk about in the holistic world is the same that they utilize in engineering. They're just talking in different terminology and utilizing it for different things. It's all energy. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this Amazing. is absolutely fascinating. And I am so impressed with all your accomplishments and, your absolute intelligence and how you utilize it at such a young age, changing the world and just educating people, helping people heal. It's just absolutely fascinating. So Carlin, how can our audience get hold of you? Well, thank you so much for saying that. Um, they can get a hold of me through my website or I'm most active on LinkedIn, but I use um, a couple platforms like YouTube and Insta but I have boundaries on them when I only actually answer once a week. So a good way is to access my website that I can give you guys if they have any questions or comments. Okay, please go ahead. Tell us what your website is. Sure. It's uh, www.animology.live. And then I have a new one that will launch probably by the 15th and it's www.carlinfisher at kajabi.com. Excellent. So animology, A-N. I M O L O G Y dot live L I V E and then Carlin Fisher at skate A R L Y N F I S C H E R at Kajabi dot com. So thank you so much for being here, Carlin. It's been fascinating. And we will be watching you and we will be following you and I'm looking forward to seeing more of you. Carlin, you also have a YouTube channel, right? Yes. Yeah, because um, I subscribed. And oh, uh, I love your little, you know, like, I think they're three-minute segments or they're short and fast, but they're super interesting. I, I love I love watching it. Oh, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, they're fun to make. Yeah. Okay, so, and so thank well, you so much for having up. me. It's been great it chatting so with you both. Yeah, and thanks for finding me on LinkedIn because it was really nice meeting you both and visiting. Yeah, it sure is. And uh, good luck with your future. And if you do go to Bali, um, if you're in Bali, wherever you're going, uh, you're going to just do so much good in the world. I just have this, mm -hmm. I have a, such a good feeling. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Remember to subscribe and we will see you next time. Take care. Bye.